Wednesday, we are going to rock out. And um, in a subsequent class, we're going to be thinking about geology in a larger context and, and visualizing things. But, but today, what we're going to be doing is, is drawing little rocks and stones. And how can you make a sketch of that rock? Um, and as you kind of continue to explore geology, you know, studying the little rocks is, is really, really fun. And being able to kind of come up with a good description of a rock in your journal page is really useful to us as, as geologists. Um, but it's only part of the story. So geology is not just sort of like rocks isolated from each other. It, they are part of a landscape that tell these amazing, amazing stories about the history of the, 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 the earth that we're walking on. That's so much fun to kind of geek out on and explore. One aspect of that is just looking at the stones themselves. So we are going to be playing with that. And I'm going to show you some tricks on how to, how to pick up a rock, how to look at it, and how to then um, transfer what you see and you're thinking about onto the page. And we're going to be using several different strategies. Um, the, uh, this is not a, a course in geology. Um, and I recommend um, courses in geology for everybody because they really kind of help us look at the landscape in a totally different way. Again, it's not just, you know, you know what rock is this and kind of labeling things. That's sort of the start of the adventure that then kind of spills out into just understanding like I'm in a valley here and why is there a valley here? And for me as an ecologist, like those are such interesting questions. And it also, it helps you think about time it, um, in a completely different way. As you start to look at rocks and stones around you, it will change your perspective of, of time. And um, so that being said, I'm gonna kind of dive into the middle of the, ge the uh, geology process. So again, so this isn't a full course on like, let's understand the difference between igneous, metamorphic and sedimentary rocks and all these different sorts of things. And like, what's a, what's a, what's a, 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 a granodiorite and what's a granite. So this isn't a class that's gonna help us be able to identify all the different types of rocks. Um, but even if you don't know any of the names for things, the strategies which we're gonna be looking at here are going to help you be able to, 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 to see details in the rocks around you and be able to record those into your journal using a lot of the same mental processes and strategies that geologists are doing. They may have more terms in their repertoire, but we're gonna be actually using a lot of geologist strategies. Um, for those who are interested in going further, um, I have a geek out book recommendation. Yeah, this one, no color pictures. And, um, but this, this is, is like one of these kind of dense technical manuals for the little geologist out there in the field. And it's about all about being actually in the field and being a geologist, how to, to, to kind of look at the world around you and to make sense of it. Um, so if you're interested in kind of going further, I'd say that this, this book is like, if you want to really dive into the geek pool on the rocks, um, that's, a, that's a crazy one. Um, let's jump over to the camera and take a look at some rocks and just sort of start by thinking about like, how am I going to transfer this onto my piece of paper? We're going to be looking at, um, how can I get a sense of the, the shape of something, the texture of something, the micro details of something, um, and also the luster and Let's, oh, uh, people are wondering about the author. Yes, oh, thank you, um, Heather. Yeah, Robert R. Compton, um, Geology in the Field. I'll, let, let's, I'll just do a quick page flip on it so you can see like, is this the kind of book that's for me? Um, <clears throat> any little elements of geology. Um, so as, as you look around it, it's got lots of little drawings like this, sort of like what you might see if you are, so there's, you know, here's stuff on geologic mapping and identifying rocks in the field. Um, there are, you know, these sort of strange diagrams, which we're going to be looking at a little bit 
more, these triangular diagrams. How do you make maps? How do you, actually I'm gonna pull this up a little bit so that we can get a better look at the book. Um, how, do, how do geologists collect data? Um, and then how do we think about and sort of diagram these different sorts of things? So there's lots of little block diagrams and visualizations of how you can think about what you're seeing and how to transfer those into your field notes, what that looks like. So it's also this really kind of interesting study in visualization and thinking about relationships between things. Um, so if that looks like it's your jam, um, this has been my recent kind of geek out. Um, and <laughs> I think it's a ton of fun. All right, let's, let's bring up a rock. Um, friends here, the rock. And here is its friend, the other rock. And so um, let's just sort of initially think about differences that we're seeing here. In here, there's a sort of grainy texture. And here, there's these sort of lumps of different sizes. They're out of focus. There we go. Lumps of different sizes. This one's a lot more angular. It's got these planes on it. This one is smooth. This one is a little bit more reflective and shiny. This one is a little bit more dull. So those are all examples of differences. And you start to pull out different rocks and you're going to see different characteristics of those sorts of things. So something that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at, you know, how can we take this suite of characters that we're seeing on a rock and translate that onto paper. Sarah Reed is recommending uh, Doris Sloan's Guide to Geology of the San Francisco Bay Region. I love that book and I love Doris Sloan. She uh, is another one of my uh, uh, mentors and teachers and uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, to take classes with her at Berserkly. All right, so let's just sort of start with thinking about some shape here, right? And we're going to build it up from there. So obviously kind of rounded here, you pick up the stone and you roll it around and you sort of say like, well, here's an, an interesting surface, but maybe a little bit too eggy. Um, oh yeah, everybody who got favorite geology put books, put those in the text. Somebody oh, please mention the... Uh, roadside geology series. Um, but you know, from this angle, I've got this little business going on. That's really interesting. This one here, there's kind of places where there's some indentations, generally oval. Interesting. This one much more angular. This one very blocky, very angular. So there's going to be some different general shapes of these, these, these objects. Um, something that I'll often do if I'm drawing a stone life size is with my, uh, with a non-photo blue pencil, I can kind of block in its shape. The only problem with kind of blocking in the shape is something with this non-photo blue pencil on, when I'm doing it on a, uh, on a projection like this is I can now see the marks that I made here, but you can't. So when I'm mimicking what I do with one of my non-photo blue pencils, um, for this, this screen here, I'm going to use this, this other pencil here that makes a line that's a little bit bigger. So I'm just sort of roughly kind of blocking out the dimensions of this. Uh, still very hard to, hear, to see. But then what I can do is, is just kind of smooth these lines together. Often if you have, you can just take your rock and put it right next to you. And I've got something that is roughly like that. Over here, this one. So 
the school that is right next to where I live, they, it's their first day of band practice and they're all out by the fence near where I live playing their instruments for the first time. And it's this wonderful, wonderful noise. I wish I had a way of recording it. Definitely that's coming through on, on your end, but you hear some sort of, but it's not the wildebeest being suffocated. That is just the start of the process. Um, so what, what I'm doing here is I'm kind of putting in, so the, of course, the, the outside edges of this, but then I'm sort of seeing another contour in here. This is sort of an edge of this and, uh, or, or along here, putting that in. Um, I'm kind of putting in, if I, if I have kind of clear edges, I might start with this outside edge and then, then I think of like from this corner here, how does that project up into it? So let me just sort of make up an, an, an imaginary shape here. Let's say I had something that was shaped like that. Very often what you'll see is from these little corners, these corner points, those are very often places where from those, there will be kind of these uh, planes of this, this object will, will kind of pick up from. And <clears throat> so I'm trying to figure out what are the different surfaces of this and I'll kind of lightly block those out. So on this one, I've got this bottom surface that I'm sort of seeing in a foreshortened way. I've got this side over here, and then I've got sort of this major side over here. So I'm blocking out sort of the angles, the, the general shape of this thing. Whether it is rounded or angular really makes a difference because different sorts of rocks erode and break down in different ways. Some things, as they sort of start to break down, they will continue to break down along kind of cleavage planes, places where the rock is going to fracture more, more easily. Others that are sort of same strength throughout the matrix of the rock are going to end up with sort of more smooth shape. So that the overall shape of the rock actually makes a, a difference to us. What does it, you know, is it, <clears throat> is it eroding into a skipping stone? Or is it eroding into uh, more of a more of a baseball? Okay. Those are really important things to, to to note. So another thing that you can do is if your your rock is really different from different angles, what you might do is just is you know create a plan and elevation view of it, or you know sort of show that you know from one end it looks like this, and from another it looks like this. One way of showing that on your piece of paper, I'm actually going to, yeah, let me kind of. When you trace around a rock, it's not going to be exact because your pencil has thickness. So you can't just kind of go right around the side or you get this thing that is larger than your rock. So I'm kind of often sort of tilting my, my, my pencil in a little bit and it gives me something that's kind of just a much more rough, rough shape. But what I like to do is to sort of make a, a little drawing like this and then put a line across it. And that is going to be a, a prime. That is for cross section. So this is kind of flat on top and it's making kind of out here. You see with this, this, with this light pencil, this light pencil, I can, I can sort of block in more the, the shape of this. So, so this is cross section A. See what I did? So this is, here's my thing. I'm sort of showing it from this angle. This is the shape of the stone. So is this, is this if I draw this one, is, am I drawing a ball or am I drawing more of a skipping stone? So by having a cross section in there, it helps me tell that story. Then what I can do is I can come over these lines more deliberately. And now I'm kind of looking at, am I, now if I just put one hard line all the way around, that kind of give, give you a little bit of a graphic feel. If I let that line in some places be kind of have holes in it, little places where there are gaps, sometimes that are lighter lines, heavier lines. Here's kind of a neat trick. I and mean, we kind of do a lighter line up here. And then as I get around the bottom, maybe I make a heavier line there. 
what that does is it tends to make this sort of feel like this object has weight. This heavier line down here starts to feel like a little bit of the shadow of that. So that sometimes in a cross section, you can, you can do that. Um, and is it smooth or is it kind of a bumpy edge? This one is sort of slightly rough. I want to kind of give a, a sense of that roughness. So is my line kind of little bumps like that? Let's zoom down on that. Whoop. Little bumps like that. Or is it kind of bigger crystals and forms in there? So the, the little angles that your pencil is making says something about the texture of that rock. Now this is fun. this one is neat because it's got this little swoop thing coming in here. Um, so I'm going to start above that, go up here, maybe a little bit lighter line, come down here, maybe a little bit of a heavier line. Now I'm going to come up in here and I'm going to tuck in and I'm going to bring this down into the matrix of the rock here. And as that line comes in, I'm going to just sort of fade it out. I want there to be a slight little bump here. Just did kind of an interesting thing called snodgrassing. Yes, you heard it here, snodgrassing. New term for the day, the snodgrass. So there was an illustrator named Snodgrass who came up with this technique where he'd often have sort of one line come in here and meet another like that. You'd sometimes kind of hit that little point with a little bit of a darker shadow mark right at that point. That is snodgrass. And so here I had this thing coming out here and I had this line coming out here, sort of suggesting where this one comes in, right where those came through. He said a little kind of triangle of dark. That's a little snodgrass point that I put in there. It kind of helps that inflection kind of take off there. This, you also see, I kind of hit this a little bit darker right in there. That's another little bit of snodgrassing going on. Sort of this, this weird illustration technique with an awesome name. So thank you, Snodgrass. We appreciate you all these years later. Um, you know, if you didn't have such an interesting name, you might have been forgotten, right, through the through time. But 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 Snodgrass, we gotta gotta keep that. All right. So I'm kind of getting the, the the shapes of some of these objects down on my my piece of paper, um, and this one kind of has an, an edge that is this this interior edge. I'm not going to just do lines like this because that is going to suggest like clear fracture planes um, instead of this little back, this sort of rough edge. So to show kind of a rough edge, what I want to do is have this edge sometimes kind of come in and it's going to zigzag back and forth. Um, and that helps. Oh, another little sawgrass. How about that? So sometimes I'll make this little kind of a zigzag edge that helps kind of show that. <clears throat> now I'm going to um, look at sort of showing the, 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 the shape and dimensions on some of these rocks. Actually, maybe we should do, should we do this one too? Because look at how interesting that one is. It's got these veins of, some intruded mineral going across it. It's very, very angular, right? So more of a challenging stone, but um, hey, that's why we, that's why we came. Um, so I'm gonna pick, uh, so the angle that you're gonna see this on your screen is gonna be different than the angle that I am looking at it. Um, and, uh, so for this, I want 
something roughly this big. And then I'm going to have a corner that comes out here. That's going to come up to a point here. That's going to come out there. I have a side that comes down like a really kind of bent packing box. And this side comes down from my angle. I see a little bit of that. So there's, I kind of get that there's these, these edges and angles. <clears throat> that one's going to be fun when we get to those veins that go across it. Um, but I'm intentionally showing it from my, my perspective with a view where I'll kind of get be able to wrap around some of these sides. I want to show not this view, but I want to show a little bit of that view where I get some of this surface in there when I've got something where there's a, especially where there, there are veins in a rock and they go around a contour. I want to be able to show what that does on more than one side. Um, but let's see, what can we do here? This, this is going to be a, well, we're going to pop out here and then down. I sometimes kind of talk out loud to myself as I am sketching. And that's not just for your benefit, it actually helps me focus and concentrate. So I'm not gonna do it like I'm not actually talking to you, but if I were just here by myself in my room, I'd be kind of going, okay, kind of come down here, then out, then over long straight, over the bump. And then, okay, now it is gonna bifurcate. Okay. Now the other side down jaggedy, and then kind of curve, more of a gentle curve, little bump, over a little bump. See what I'm doing is I'm kind of talking my way over around and through the stone. Um, this way down straight up and then in and peter out. Drop down, over, jiggle, bump. So when my, I, I see the bump, if I say bump, it helps my hand actually put in a bump in that place. And by sort of, so I'm doing this actually out loud and that helps my brain be able to get those little jiggles and wiggles rather than my brain would otherwise want to just sort of over smooth the whole business. So that kind of talking it out loud is a useful, useful strategy. All right. Now let's on these little friends here. Um, let's put in a little bit of volume. Um, um, and, and so I want to sort of show, start to, to, to sculpt these. And then I'm going to put in color and texture, All right? Um, so let's, uh, what I'm going to do to, to, to sculpt them is today I'm going to be using some watercolor. And this isn't watercolor paper. I, I thought I had some big sheets of watercolor paper, but I didn't. So this is just actually typing paper. So it's not really, it's not official watercolor paper, um, but you'll still see that it's, it's gonna work with, with watercolor. The paper will probably buckle a little bit and that's gonna be okay. My brush is, my favorite brush is the um, large fine point Pentel Aquash water brush. And I use that along with an old sock, zoom out for a second put the sock on my wrist so that when I'm changing colors, I just squeeze this and wipe it on my, on my little sock. Um, these are great for the field and I now use them uh, extensively in the studio. So this is pretty much the only brush that I used. And I'm going to start just by putting a little bit of shadow on this. Um, now in the room that I'm sitting, In the room that I'm sitting, light is coming through the window in front of me from two windows and casting this diffuse light. To make this a little bit easier to understand, I'm actually going to change the lighting angle and position. Um, I'm going to imagine that the light is coming from the left-hand side so that the shadow will be cast on the right. This is a convention in scientific illustration. 
that often makes the drawing a little bit easier to understand and to read. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a little bit of purplish gray from my palette. This is mostly Shadow Violet, the color Shadow Violet by Daniel Smith. And I'm going to test that color and by putting a little blotch down on my paper. Now that's much too dark for what I want. I want kind of just a subtle suggestion that there's a shadow. And so I'm gonna wipe a little bit of that off on my sleeve. Now I've got something that's a little bit lighter, something that's a little bit lighter. You see how there with each little wiggle on the sleeve, it's getting a little bit lighter. And now I finally get something that, all right, now I'm going to kind of just put this along this edge here. Notice that I'm leaving a little trim of light around the right hand edge. Doing that on purpose. And now I'm going to clean my brush completely and smooth this edge, kind of pick up a little bit of this edge and make it a little bit softer. What about on this one here, <clears throat> right? If this were an object that had a big ridge in the middle, um, there would be a shadow kind of starting somewhere in here, but because this is going mostly flat across the top and then only turning in here, I'm going, I'm getting that I'm, I would have the shadow just kind of close to this edge. So I'm going to, again, do the same thing. And I'm going to put my shadow in just on the edge here, then take that side of it, make it a little bit smoother. And then I'm letting that dry. What about this one here? All right, this is this very angular stone. The light is coming from this side. This side is going to be in full light. That'll put this side in shadow. This side will be in shadow. So if the light's coming from here, I'll have some shadow in those zones. And because this one is more angular, um, I'm going to kind of go for um, not the shadows that are as blended, but shadows that are a little bit more kind of crisply stopping on a hard edge. So the more I blend it, the more it suggests a rounded stone, the more I kind of tightly end a shadow color at um, a margin, that's, that's going to be helpful for this. Um, and these shadows, I'm not making them too dark. I um, don't want them, to, I want the, the structure, the color to show through on these drawings. And um, I, I, so I don't want that to be, uh, that shadow to overwhelm it. So very often illustrators will make these sort of soft shadows that to sort of suggest the form and texture of something. And it's really useful to have a little test zone where you sort of see how much paint is in your brush before you kind of hit it down. On the piece of paper here, I'm going to do the same thing. Here is this surface here. I'm going to put that crisply in shadow. Test. So I put down some shadows that suggest the form. The more faded, feathered the edge is, the more it's suggesting smooth rounding. Um, the more that the shadow starts towards the side, that suggests that it's flat on top and then curving towards the side. So, um, and when there's a sharp edge on the shadow, that suggests hard edges on the object. I now let that dry. And here, I'm going to speed up that process with the <clears throat> Vagabond 1600. And it's not working. <laughs> let's see, let's see. Oh, maybe there's that little button on there. That... Uh, um, on, on, not working. 
time. So I'm underneath my table here, just struggling with an extension cord. And uh, yeah, that's not going to work today. So I have a broken hair dryer. Um, so I, I'm going to let this dry. And it's dry enough for me to be able to do this and not smear anything. It's dry enough for me to be able to put um, other tones and colors on top of this. So that's what I'm going to do now. Um, I'm going to start to build up the color and the texture of these. And then I will also play a little bit with the lightness of it, the luster of it. You can see a little bit of these wrinkles in the paper. That's because it's not watercolor paper. So paper is doing a little bit of warbling, warping, because it's not, um, it's not really paper that is designed to take water. Um, but you'll still see that I'm going to get some reasonable stones. All right, so let's take a look at this. Um, I put in my shadow, and now I want to put, I want to get this, what's called the local color, the sort of the general color of this. If I put the texture in first and then put the color over that, I'm going to destroy all my texture. So what I'm going to do is I am going to um, put in the color first on top of the shadow. And then I'll put the texture on top of that. So I like to, in my palette, have a bunch of different colors and browns. Um, and what I will do is bring a lot of those together and just sort of experimentally sort of see what kind of gets me close to what I'm, I'm doing now. Here's a test on the piece of paper. And then I look at it next to the object. OK, so that's much too intense and a little bit too kind of greenish. Maybe a little bit duller. Maybe that's a little bit too much. Let's try this color here. What's that? Okay, now, no, not at all, not at all. All right, I don't like that at all. I'm going to grab one of my favorite colors is buff titanium in here, which always sort of seems to get me out of holes. Maybe buff titanium will come into, come in for the rescue here. Buff titanium, help me out, buff titanium. Ah, we're getting closer. So a little bit uh, greenish, maybe want to warm that up with a little bit of yellow. that uh, still a little bit greenish. So if we're if I'm looking at it and it's a little bit too greenish, um, then what is on the opposite side of the color wheel from green? Well, maybe a little bit of red. So what if I pulled a little bit of red into this and see if that pushes it more towards, ah, look at that. So did you see, okay, did you see what just happened? So we had something that was too greenish. We put in some, what is the color on the opposite side of the color wheel from the green? That's the red or the magenta. So I just went over to this part of my palette. I had some gunk that was just sort of reddish in here. I picked it up right from that area there and put that in there. And now we've got something that's a lot closer to the color. All right, so what I'm gonna do is just take that color and paint it across this object. And as I do, my strokes are going to follow the general curves and contour of this in case any strokes show up. You notice that that shadow shows through. Now I have this brown stone with a shadow on it. Ooh. All right, but see, that's how, that's how I think of color mixing. Like I get something and it's the wrong color. And at first I was just sort of rambling, going like, let's try some other brown, let's try some other brown. And then I'm going like, okay, now it's just clearly, it's too green. 
What do I specifically need to do to kind of counter out that? Um, the, uh, yeah, the Vea and I are both parts of the buff titanium Pantone. And, but by then picking specifically a red to go in there, that changed the color to something that I, gives me something closer to my stone. Um, a couple other details on this. This has this sort of dark brown blotch out here. I'm gonna kind of see if I can get something that is that color of that dark brown blotch. And where does that dark brown blotch go? It, it goes in here and down here. I wonder what that is. So that is just a color, strange kind of color blotch. It is on the stone. There's also some of those browns, those same browns in here. So I'm just sort of matching kind of color for color where I'm finding those on my little stone. Now, what about this bad boy? All right. Well, let's 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 play with that. Um, the general strategy in watercolor is to start lighter and go darker because you can always put darker things on top of something. So I'm going to try to get something that is the sort of gray color of the general matrix of this. And so I'm going to start just with a sort of mixing in my palette. I've got sort of a lot of stuff in the sort of gray part of my palette. Let's see what happens if I just sort of mix those together. I get something like that. It's way too dark. Can we lighten that? The way you lighten with watercolors, you add some water to something, All right? Add some water to it, and then you can test it again. And let's, yeah, that'll be kind of close enough. All right, so I'm going to put just a light wash of this gray in over this. And while that is drying, I'm going to go over here. So you dry nicely, I'll be back. Um, so now this one is more interesting. There is sort of a warm uh, kind of color to the lightest parts of this. There's a warmth to that. Um, so warmth means sort of more on the yellow ochre side. So I'm going to first just test some colors here. Yeah, just a little bit. But first, just put a, a sort of slightly warm yellow coat over that. Then while that's drying, I'm going to bop down to this one here. And this is interesting, because here there are these clear veins that are going through. And the when I'm drawing these in, I need want to pay attention to where those go, because I'm going to be treating those in different ways. And something that's neat is that as this vein wraps around the side, you'll see the vein change its direction. So expect veins to, to do that on you, sort of to change their direction as they wrap around the side. So I'm just blocking where this one goes. So I've made some light indications of where I want those veins to go. And um, I am going to um, now get a greenish gray. So I'll take a little bit of green on my palette and I'll mix that with some gray. And that's way too watery, don't like that. Um, let me zoom back out so you can just watch how I'm doing this color mixing. All right, I'm starting up here. I want some kind of greenish 
want some greenish gray. So I'm going to bring that into here, mix that with some gray and check. Oh, I got lucky. <laughs> um, that, that seems to be relatively close. So I'm just going to go with that and I'm going to paint that in here. And paint that in here. And then those greens continue down onto this side here. So I am putting stuff into this vein rock. Probably thinks this song is about it. I should have done this first, but this white part isn't really white, is it? It is more of a, there's also a slight yellowish brown cast in there. So I'm gonna get just a little bit of light yellowish brown, maybe not that. Oh, I should have tested more. <laughs> Remember I'm saying, always test before. But part of the darkness in here is probably just wet paper because if I get a totally clean brush and I put it down on this paper, it makes a dark mark. And then that dries and it's white again. So. Yeah, maybe I'll be okay then. Meanwhile, while that's drying, let's jump back to these two because what are they lacking? They're lacking some texture. And we can do that while this little nice rock over here is 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 is, is getting ready. Let's let's mess with this one here. Um, and I'll show you guys some fun things to do with something like this. So I want got a little, I want to get a little bit of a sense of texture on this. And if I look at this carefully, and I'll focus, there we go. There are tiny little grains in there, tiny little grains. They're not much darker than the rest of the matrix, but it's observable. So what can I do? I'd like to introduce my high-tech tool. This, let's focus, is my toothbrush. All right, well, it's actually my art toothbrush. Um, the, um, what I'm going to do is I am going to first make a little bit of a mask. So here's a piece of toilet paper. I'm going to get a little hole in it. It is going to be roughly, let's go up here so we can see this whole process. It's going to be roughly the size, maybe a little bit smaller than that rock. Okay, so I've got bad judgment in size of rock. This is much larger than that. Um, so uh, what can I do? I'm gonna take this and put that around that side. I can take this, put that up there, and I'm gonna tear off another little piece. Whoa, just messed everything up. There's a little mask. I'm going to turn the rough edge towards it. And here is my toothbrush. I'm going to pick up some light. Actually, I need some water in that. So I'm going to just take my brush, just give it a squeeze, put a drop of water in my palette. There's a drop of water. And I am going to squizzle my brush in it. Squizzle, an official art term. I'm 
going to test that off on the side over here. Very often, some of the first drops that come off of it will be really powerful and intense. And so I'm now going to lightly just, I'm thumbing this, getting a little bit of I'll need a little bit more water on my palate. I'm going to drop in there. I put a little bit more this light brown. Test. And what I want to do is I want to get this more or less coming straight down instead of out at an angle. And I don't want to, to really pull these, 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 these back and have them super swing forward. Otherwise my drops go forward with a lot of enthusiasm, right? And when they do that, they tend to make lines instead of just a few little dots. So you see my, my mask worked fairly well. There's a little bit of stuff outside my mask. And so what I do is I kind of, I'm gonna quickly kind of come over there and see if any of that is stuff that I can just pick up by brushing over it. Perhaps when that paper dries, those will be, you see, you know, I've just got this little sort of sprinkling of texture in there. And that is going to suggest the texture of that rock. So a little bit of splatter can give you kind of a grainy effect. Another thing that you can do that is very interesting is, let's just kind of go back for this. For this, I don't need to be quite as careful. Um, I'm going to get my, oh, I wish I had a jar of water here to clean my toothbrush. I'm gonna get my toothbrush relatively clean off on the sides. I used a little bit of spit, but nobody saw that because that'd be kind of gross. If I don't tell you, you won't know. But my brush is now a lot cleaner. No, it's not. Ah, now wiping it on my pants. What I'm gonna do is actually come in here into some of the white gouache. Uh, zoom back up, whoop, hope you're not getting dizzy. I'm gonna just zoom into the white gouache here. I'm gonna pick up a little bit of this white gouache. And I'm gonna do the same. And if the effect shows up, it will be subtle. If it ends up being noticeable, it will be cool. But it's it's a it's a it's a there we go a little bit of white splatter on that, and then I'm going to just let that sit. By the way, if you overdo it and you don't like some of that texture, what you can do is just with a damp brush, you just kind of come in and you can kind of tap some of those areas and the effect of that is lessened. Let's see, there's a few little just speckles, ah, I like that, okay? So let's go on to this one over here. What are we gonna do over here? Right. Check, oh, I've got about five minutes for the rest of the class. Oh, dear. Um, now, I want to introduce you to another little friend of mine. And that is the natural sponge. So this is a piece of a natural sponge and it has a rough edge. So I've got a bunch of little kind of chunks of natural sponge, right? You don't need a lot of natural sponge to kind of get this effect. Um, so usually in my nature journal kit, I'll carry, you know, just you know, maybe a a piece like this somewhere in my nature journal kit. And um, on other classes, I can show you how these make great trees and moss and lichen and things. But here, what we're gonna be doing is taking a look at its effect for giving you these sort of spots on the surface of the rock. These are different minerals that are put in there. All right. So what I'm going to do 
is uh, back up. Right, you see the whole playing field. I am going to get, so what color are these? It's sort of a dark gray. So I'm going to get some darks. And I'm going to test that by taking the tip of this sponge, putting it in here, picking some of that up, and now I'm going to test it out here. Oh, look at that. So it's sort of, you know, that, that's good enough. Now, I, I want to kind of keep this stuff where I want it to be. So I'm going to, as I'm kind of coming around here, I'm kind of near an edge. I can and as you wrap around the edge of something, so those give me the blotches on top, but as you wrap around the edges, blotches get become, in the center, they can be more sort of large blotches, but those will, on the edges, tend to be more little lines. And so I'm going to then just add in a few around the edges, places where there, there are, are, are just some of these things that are kind of clearly more um linear some of these little marks in this way in this area so these are these are just sort of suggesting that your blotches as you rock around rock around the well as you wrap around the side of the rock not rock around the side of the rock um you're seeing those more on their side in a foreshortened view and so some of those are turning to to, to do these more linear marks. Let me zoom down on that. That's not blotch by blotch, the exact same pattern, but uh, that is, that's a pretty good effect. Let's try that over here with this rock, where there's actually several different minerals. You see that there are these white minerals, there are these gray minerals, and then there are these dark black type of minerals. So what I can do is, uh, where's my little friend, the sponge? I'm gonna test off on the side what I've got. Okay, that's still, that's pretty good, but I, I maybe I want it to be slightly less, so I'm going to get rid of some of the... No, it's making the wrong shape now. I think what I want is this to be more diluted before those. And that's better. So. There's a few of those light colored ones. And then I want some of the dark colored ones. So just put in a little bit of dark black paint on this. I'm just going to lightly tap, lightly tap. And I get a few of those minerals on it. So the sponge can give you all sorts of kind of wonderfully irregular patterns and effects that will give you, you know, quite the sense of these little minerals. And if I want to kind of specifically put in a little mineral, like, like there's this cool little one in here, so it's got a long shape to it. 
I can then test. See, that was way too dark for my PI testing. If you overdo it, you can always just go and slightly tap it with a clean brush so that that comes out. Finally, this little rock friend in here needs a little bit more attention. And come up here. Um, some of these rock surfaces, um, they could use a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more sculpting. And also there's this tiny little bit of texture up in here. Oh, how might I do that? Well, I might, might be able to get away with a little bit of sponging, trying to figure out, do I use my sponge? Do I use my brush? Let's just, because I'm having fun with my sponge, I'm gonna test with some sponge and And what it does is just going to introduce a little bit of irregularity into this. And another way you can get a little bit of texture is with what's called dry brush. If sometimes you take kind of the, the, the side of your brush, especially if your paper has a little bit of texture to it, you can make these little kind of sort of side of your brush marks and it feels like this there's, there's, a, there's a little bit less control than if you're using the tip of it and it gives you a little bit of a sense of these sort of irregularities of of, 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 a, of a surface sometimes when you're not quite controlling what the brush does and there's a bit of kind of accidental that comes into your mark making um you'll you'll make marks that feel just a little bit more like the kind of natural irregularities. And we're kind of loosely holding this brush. And I think I maybe want to, to slightly darken it right along the edges of this, some of these veins to make these little veins stand out just a little bit more. these show you I'm gonna go over just a couple minutes um, do one last thing that will be a lot of fun on on these what I'm going to do is take a little bit more of this sort of purpley gray mixture mix that up test it off on the side and this time I've got something that is it's a little bit darker um, than what I was originally using in my shadow. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this for the cast shadows. So if my light is coming down here on this one, then the edges of this are going to do something like that. And the edges of this one are gonna do something like this. Edges of this one. They're going to be out here, and the edges of this one, it's fairly low. They're going to be out 
here. So I'm thinking like, if you actually have a consistent light direction, you can see where your light is falling. You should just, you just look where your light is. But here I'm kind of having to make up where my shadows are going to go. Um, and I'm gonna start kind of in here, close to this. And then so along here. Again, that shadow color I'm using is Daniel Smith's Shadow Violet. It's a mixture of sort of uh, blues, purples, reds, gives you the sort of dull purple gray color. I'm gonna make this a little bit stronger because it's a higher rock. And I'm making the shadow darker right towards the base of it. That's called an occlusion shadow. An occlusion shadow is sort of where you get the object itself kind of really kind of tucking into sort of a deeper shadow right close to the base of it. I want that to be a little bit more diffuse. And that kind of, that pops the object out. So first I'm putting in this shadow close to the edge. And then I'm picking up more of that color and just darkening that a little bit close to the object. Because the paper is still wet, the outer edge of this dark that I'm now putting in is going to fade out a little bit and make for a more sort of softed, softer blended edge on that shadow. Be interesting to see how it looks when they dry, um, because I because I'm using a little bit of uh, this one here. On how they look at it, I think it wants a slightly. I prefer not to kind of get in here and overwork things, but I think that its little shadow along this edge wants to be slightly stronger. No, not that strong. Should always put one ahead. <laughs> eh, it's alright. Now, in my fantasy timeline, I had time to do this entire demonstration and also then show you folks these little things about doing close-ups of little crystals and things inside on the texture of the rock. Um, and then showing you how to use these kind of cool triangle diagrams as a visualization and thinking tool that they're using throughout these geology texts but I'm already 10 minutes over. So that's just not gonna to happen today. But we're going to follow up on these techniques, um, kind of expanding tools that we have for um, drawing rocks and visualization. We'll bring that, some of that into our next class on drawing rocks. Um, and I hope that these techniques were useful to you. So again, we've got, we're, I, was, I was tracing around things, I was blocking in shadows, I was dropping in local color and then adding texture. I could either add texture with the tip of my brush. I also use my toothbrush and a natural sponge. Um, the, uh, if you don't have a natural sponge, another thing you can do is just get some, um, get some you know, wadded up Kleenex or something and kind of make it all rough and then dip that into your paint and then test 
on the side, not right on top of your rock initially, sort of test on your piece of paper, like what, how does that look? And you'll often get um, uh, um, shapes that are, are, are really cool. So what I want to do is now just sort of throw this open for discussion and comments. Uh, let's initially kind of stick to sort of drawing rocks and then we can go into sharing um, sharing other ideas um, that you have, um, other journal pages. We'd also love to see what is up. This is also a wonderful time for us to share um, images. But let's just start off. We're going to make it possible for you to unmute yourselves. You can now unmute yourselves. Um, if you've got a question, all you have to do is um, turn on your camera and wave at me and I will probably see you waving. And, or you can use the raise hand button. So I'm gonna jump over to Mary. And uh, Mary's got a comment or a question. Hold on a second, I'm going to add you in. Hey, Mary, thank you for joining us. Well, first of all, this was just awesome. I've struggled with rocks for so long. This was so helpful. Here's my question. Um, when you had your light source kind of in the upper right hand corner, when you started oh, sorry. with I meant, your- I meant um, upper left. So I'm dyslexic, I just said upper right okay. is my bad. So the, the reason that there's like, there's this convention in scientific illustration that the light source comes from the top left hand corner. And the reason is that um, most people are right-handed. So if you're sitting at a table and you're drawing with your right hand and the object is in front of you and the light source is on top of you, it is going to wash out the object and you're not gonna see the textures of it. If you put it in the bottom right, your hand will block the light going to the object. So, so if, if, if it's, you know, your, the light's down here, your hand is here and you're drawing the thing here and the object is here, your hand is then blocking it. If you put the light in the top, um, right. Then also sometimes the artist's hand would be in there blocking it, but that's not going to be a problem. I mean, top, yeah, top right. But if you put the light in the top left, then it's, it hits the object and then it comes over to your piece of paper. So it was just a convenience for right-handed yeah. illustrators. And the result of this is that now, because this is a convention, you have seen um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of top left hand illustrations without ever knowing that these were all top left hand light illustrations. So our brains in, at least in Western cultures, our brains are so used to seeing top left hand light that when we see bottom right in, in light or, or light from, coming from a different direction, it can be confusing to our brains. If, you ever look, if you've ever looked at a photograph of say footprints in the sand and it looks like the footprint rather than going into the sand is sticking out of the sand. Um, you can kind of get this illusion where the footprint, sort of the shadow sort of make it looks like it's sticking out, like it's this reverse footprint. What's going on with that? Well, that's just that it's a normal footprint into the sand, but it's just that the light is coming from a direction that you don't expect. So you can kind of get things that you sh you're, that should be popping out, popping in when you don't use top left-hand light. So it's just a convention that came from but I know that so, wasn't the answer to your question, but it was, it was an aside that I couldn't help but go on. So. Okay, but am, am I remembering correctly that when you started with the shadow, you didn't go all the way to the right, bottom right edge with the yes. shadow? And if yes. so, why? Yes, why okay, great that? question. So that was um, intentional. And what I was doing is I was leaving a little bit of room for reflected light. Um, so some light is gonna go past the object bounce off something here and bounce back mm -hmm. into the dark side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, you don't see that reflected bounce light on the moon because there's no object there, except when it's a thin crescent and you're getting a little bit of bounce light back off mm -hmm. the earth itself. Um, mm -hmm. But so an, an object that is just by itself in space with nothing else near it, there's gonna be no reflected light on that side. But if it's say on a, on a table that is slightly reflective, light will go past it, bounce off that and shine a little bit of light into the dark side. Got it, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Absolutely, no, great, great question. Because that, that was a subtle little detail, but it's, it's important. Um, thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Um, let's jump over to um, Ellen. Um, again, Mary, thank you so much for, for that. 
I'm going to go um, Aaron, uh, uh, Ellen, and then Emmanuel. Um, let's see what we've got. So, hey, good to see you. You can. Oh, I put it in the chat, but um, towards the beginning, you had a line through um, one of the rocks uh, labeled A and then something else on the other side, maybe it was AA. And, oh, yeah, A um, and A prime. A prime, did, yeah. review that please. Sure, so what we're talking about there is the idea of if I want to show the shape of my rock, um, then what I'm going to be doing is a cross section is a very useful way of doing that. So what I can do is if say, say here's here's my here's my rock, and if I have a line, I'm just going to put a line, straight line here and a straight line here, and over here is a prime, and over here is a, and this then is my cross section. This is cross section a, and what I'm doing is mm -hmm. I'm showing. That if I did a slice through this rock right at this level and looked at it from the side, this is the shape that I would see. So it's a way of showing where a cross section goes on a drawing. So that the person can see like, oh, this is a slightly flattened rock. It's not full in pancake mode. Not quite a skipping stone, um, but this isn't a totally rounded rock. This is is slight, slightly rounded, and that little mark there, mark there, helped me be able to see that. You could also, so you could do, you know, a cross section through this way and through this way. So you could do multiple cross sections through a rock, and um, or any object. You know, imagine um, a, a, a a seed pod of a plant. Um, you could do multiple cross sections through those. And here we're not able to actually cut it and draw the inside. And so what I'm doing is I can just put in some diagonal lines saying like this is the matrix of whatever this rock is. Did that make sense? Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm also thinking you could also make a silhouette. You could turn the rock around um, 90 degrees and show that it's thinner. So that would give some indication of the footprint as well. Absolutely, that would be a really good thing to do because that, then you're just you're just giving more information about this phenomenon that you've observed. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your question. Um, um, let's jump over to uh, Manuel. Um, it's really good it's to really see you again. Hello. My question is, I can create shadows with this, this one. Ah, um, so do, do, do you found it ch challenging to do the shadow with that pencil? Yes. Ah, um, well, so, sometimes um, with different tools, like, did you find like it, it gave you a shadow that was a little bit too dark? No, I just don't know how, how to use it for shadow. Oh, uh, you, you're wondering on how to use a, a, a pencil that is a wash pencil for a, a, a shadow. Mm, I, I know that, but but I can create shadows with this in, in, instead of, 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 of these colors, these, these bright colors. Oh, I can create. Yeah, so what I would suggest, let's see if I've got one of those type of pencils on hand, and I'll just do a quick little demo for you on that, if I can find my wash pencil. Ah, a wash pencil, all right. So I'll, I'll do a little demonstration about um, doing a, um, yeah, you've got the Derwent one, I've got the General Sketch and Wash. So we both oh. got, so very similar pencils. Um, but what these are, are water soluble pencils. Oh, yeah. And so um, what I can do is let's say I have my 
stone. Mm -hmm. Right? And mm -hmm. the light is coming in this case from this direction. So okay. that's going to cast a shadow on this side. I'm first going to just do a little test with this pencil to see how dark a shadow it makes. Let's find out. I'm going to hit this with a little bit of water. And okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use a very, very light touch on this. And I'm going to lightly put a few little marks of this shadow color on this side. I saw that's very light here, but I think that when I hit it with just a little bit of water here, one second. Mm -hmm. It is going to darken that up a little bit. Part of what you're seeing here is just this part of this darkness is just um, that, uh, but I've actually smeared a bunch of this, this, this up. And then what's going to happen is as, uh, once this dries, I will have a smoother shadow area in here. And then on totally dry paper, I can put in the rest of my little details on dry paper, I could add in the little minerals in the rock and other sorts of things. But I want to make sure that that shadow that I'd drawn was completely dry before oh. I added any other colors. Because otherwise what will happen is, is this, that I will bring in, um, let's say another pencil to start to draw on it. And I'll start to try, sort of draw these and I'm just gonna tear up my paper like that because it's wet. The wet paper wants to tear. So I let that totally dry so my paper doesn't shred. And then I'll be able to draw in those little details. This is so interesting. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad that that was useful. Yeah, those that, that well, those wash uh, pencils that you have are, are very, very um, useful things. You know, it makes me think, would you like me to do a workshop at some point in the future uh, specifically about using wash pencils? Wash pencils? Um, they, these sort of water-soluble pencils. Oh, um, yes, that is so interesting. All right. And there are, are, are shadows, and and let's say it's night. Um, and your subject and um, doesn't have shadows. Yeah. So, um, you're saying like, how would you go about drawing something at night? When mm -hmm. there's you, you can't really sort of see little subtle, subtle shadows. Um, like let's say there's there's maybe an owl. You're looking up. There's a, a, an owl in a tree. The the whole situation is fairly dark, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in those sorts of situations, let's say imagine that you have the the, the trunk of the, the the tree coming down. Um, what you really want to do is. Is is emphasize to yourself the um, the sort of the, the the sort of lights and 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 darknesses of the of the whole thing. So you're you kind of when we're drawing at night, we're often kind of giving up on the idea of getting to see detail and texture and color, and we're just looking at these. Um, these, 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 these shapes. Let's turn this into a horned owl. Yes, at least what we see. Oh, that's a great horned owl. That's so cool. Um, we we should just focus on this the the shape of the subject at night, not not at, at the details. And and even at day, if you look at at your subject, uh. Uh, and and you you don't remember the the details. I like to color in gray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a very good strategy. To, it sort of helps you focus on shape. Rather yes. Than, um, 
sort of thinking that you have to, to, to somehow get, you know, and, and also very often what people will do is they will start to draw in all of this detail that they can't really see from that distance, that they can't on it really realistically see from that distance. So if you are just sort of drawing what you see, you're kind of getting those shapes, um, yeah, just drawing with, with some tones of gray is a really great way to train yourself to see different values. One way you can do that is with one of these, these sketch pencils. You can do that with graphite pencil. Um, also, maybe having a couple of, of, of Tombow uh, gray pens, so not all the color ones. You've just got a couple of the gray ones in your pocket. Then it, it kind of helps you kind of be like, oh, I'm just gonna look at light and darks. Also, for anybody out there who's just starting to do watercolor, um, uh, a, a really great strategy is to begin with um, just choosing one dark value color and doing your whole landscape drawing with that. So it's just like a black and white photograph, but you're just maybe using, you know, Payne's gray to do the entire painting and just getting yourself to look at lights and darks and lights and darks and lights and darks and showing those lights and darks. Those are and once you kind of get used to start showing lights and darks, then you can start to bring in a little bit more color. Um, but eventually oh, getting those lights and darks. Really good. So we'll, we'll put together a workshop for you, uh, uh, Emmanuel, on uh, drawing with those um, water-soluble uh, sketch pencils. Yes, this is so cool. And in, in, in the next class, I, I will ask you how to use this one. That, that that is the, the 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 same mark, but it seems to be different, different, different. Ah, yeah, I'm not sure on that. Uh, maybe send me an email with the names of those pencils, the whole all the information and the code numbers on those pencils. I might be able to do a little bit of research before the next class. Oh, cool. okay. Excellent. Try to do that. Hey, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for asking such an interesting and uh, insightful question. I really appreciate your, um, your, your contributing. Bye-bye. Thanks. Absolutely. Bye-bye, my friend. Bye-bye. Um, let's bring in Susan. Hey there, Susan. It's great to see you. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, I was... Um... I was uh, intrigued by, or I was really sort of pleased by your whole uh, discussion of showing the cross section of the rocks and um, the idea of featuring that and, and that the shape of the rock is important. Uh, so I have not so much a question as kind of a show and tell bouncing off of that, if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. Let me minimize my screen too so we can see this um, show and tell better. Yes, please. So it's not an intro. This is actually from something that happened a few years ago. Uh, before I started nature journaling, but you've inspired me to actually do a little nature journaling about this, maybe go back to the place where this was. So I do like to collect um, rocks, especially like you know, river rocks. And you most of the time I find, you know, rocks like on you know lake shores and things that are like skipping stones, like you mentioned, that you know it's it's very round in this direction, but it's very flat this direction. Uh, but I once recent a few years ago was at a location where I found some rocks, the the most spherical tumbled water tumbled rocks I've ever seen like this is the only time I've ever seen okay I can't really <laughs> like they're they're almost perfectly spherical oh my what goodness. a great mystery and, right well so I so I have a theory or a hypothesis about why that was and what it was was this was in location in the Adirondacks um at a waterfall on the Hudson River. And in that area, the Hudson River is still small enough to <laughs> be a fairly small and fairly clean river that you can just kind of wade in. And at the top of this waterfall area, it was like there was an area that was kind of safe enough to, to walk in. And it was sort of going over this like rock face. And there were all these like sinkholes in the rock that the water was in. And the water would go in there and it would swirl around. And in the bottom of all these sinkholes were all of these small rocks about this size that were like almost perfectly round. Oh, so, oh how so interesting. Really That's so yeah. cool. This rock that came from a lake was being washed by sort of the, you know, sort of run by the, the, the waves and things at the edge of the lake and was being smoothed 
in such a way that it wasn't being broken up into smaller pieces necessarily, but it was just having its edges smoothed down. These ones, because of the violence of them being swirled around in these sink holes, were both carving out the holes in the rock, but also just being knocked and battered from all sides and being made small. So that's my theory. I'm very intrigued to see if I can find more occurrences of that. And also maybe to go back to that location where I, I was a few years ago with my nature journal and see what I can see and see what more I can record now that I'm kind of thinking about this in a more scientific way. So that was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, um, let's actually see if we can crowdsource this. Um, so challenge to anybody who's watching right now, um, can you find round stones in places where these sort of sinkhole phenomena um, or where there's a little pothole in a, in a stream where something's gonna get tumbled around, where that, where that is not happening, mm -hmm. can you um, find, um, or, or can you also go to places where you can find little potholes in rivers near you and see if you start looking inside those, can you also find round, rounded stones instead of flattened ones in those? So let's see if we can, um, if, uh, if anybody has any of these um, uh, phenomena going on uh, for them, um, we'd love to see what, um, what, you, what you find. So can you find the round rocks in places where the, uh, where river potholes don't exist, and also start going into river potholes and seeing what you what you what you are finding there. Are you finding round ones? That would be really cool. And also, does it does it is 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 there a connection between that and the types of rocks that you find? I just happened to pull out. These are like I don't know I don't know my geology too well, but I think that these are something in the sort of granite kind of family. And this other one, it, from it, it's lake, easy to take them for granite. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but like in other places, you know, I've, I've seen, I found like other rocks with smaller crystals, like that brown one that you did versus the very large, you know, crystals of black and white and things. So, you know, I wonder if that makes a difference in terms of how the rocks break and what sorts of shape they, shapes they end up and so on and so forth. That's really cool. I, I love it. And so, hey, anybody who's out there who's watching, um, if you are looking at this, um in in video add comments into the video um and um anybody who is uh, sort of discovers these things on a future class um just sort of chime in real time and we'd love to hear what you find hey susan thank you so much for the little mystery thank you um i would now like to bring in <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> um i'd love to bring in janice um with a question or a comment um comment. yeah hey there. I, I have a comment um it, it sounded to me like what susan might might have been seeing was glacial potholes um they they um the stone gets caught in a little indentation and then it just keeps going around and it and it gradually makes this a rounded dent and the stone itself becomes round as it's doing that and so that's it, it just may, might be what it is. And Susan, if you're close enough, if you were um, on the Hudson in, in uh, Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts, there's a, there's a place that's got a whole, um, the, the, river, uh, the river is exposed over a cliff and it's filled with glacial potholes. And you can see it right from, right from the edge, Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts. That, that was it. Oh, fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I love the kind of the, the wealth of sort of naturalist knowledge um, that we have in this uh, community. Um, exploring and investigating phenomena or phenomena around us is just is so much fun. So much fun. So let's see if there are any um, other um, journal pages or journaling experiences. It doesn't have to be related to rocks. Um, that have uh, got you interested? Did anybody want to share some stuff that you have going on? If so, I would like to invite you to do that. Um, I'm going to now bring on Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, We're uh, in progress with our um, Mountain Meadows infographic together. 
Um, let me bring on Anne. Hey there, Anne, good to see you. Hi, Jack. Thanks for a great session today. Good to see everybody. Um, so maybe you, Jack, can talk about this, but we, when we are putting together our Mountain Meadows infographic, and we're gonna have probably a poster with some call outs um, using the wonderful artwork that we received from this community. And we received so far 78 different submissions. Really, really, which just, was just really fantastic. rich. For, for, from our perspective, getting to play with this stuff, it's just like, I feel like a kid in a candy shop. I've just got um, all this amazing resources to, to play with. I'm like, I'm gonna put that one next to this one. And ooh, what about if I put this one next to this one? I'm gonna show the beaver this way. And it's just, yeah. it's, it is fun. It is really yeah, fun. Yeah, so thanks to all of you for your great submissions. And um, submissions are closed because now we're just moving forward with putting this all together. And in the process, we're talking about maybe crowdsourcing somebody who can help us animate. Um, and maybe you can describe better, Jack, what, what we need in terms of somebody to oh, yeah. help. Sure. We were... Yep. Um, so we're not quite at the, the, the point ready where we're to, to hand off materials to this person. But if there's a person who's watching this who has um, familiarity with making rollover web graphics, what we'd love to do is to have uh, an image on a, a, a page where you could roll over different things on that page and then things would kind of pop out and expand from that or you could click on them and then kind of get more deeper information. So if you are, have experience making rollover graphics, uh, we're looking for, um, we're all kind of volunteering our time on this. And so I'm afraid that at this point it is not um, a, a, a paid project. But if there's somebody who knows how to do that, who might be able to take this, when we get the final images together, would be able to turn that into um, a rollover for us. Or um, perhaps there will be funding at some point in the future. That, that is, it is a possibility. Um, if you need, um, you let us know. Um, if there is, so somebody who's got um, rollover chops, um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Anne. Thanks. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Ray Bonto, who's got some journaling um, resources to show us. Hey, Arpan, good to see you too. Ray Bonto, good to see you. Hi, John. Hi. So, uh, this is the rock. Yeah. I decided to do just ink. Yeah, well, th this uh, it, the 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 way you've handled the that just sort of the indication of the the shadow on the right hand side gives me a real sense of its form. I also like the line variability. Um, had this been enclosed in one heavy line all the way around it, it would not be as visually interesting. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so everybody, let's let's check this out together. So, I want, want folks to look at this illustration. This is um, you're ex uh, sort of moving into a different style here than you've played with uh, before. But notice how you can feel the contours of these elephants. They actually they feel like they have a real three-dimensional shape. You can put your hand on the side of the elephant and roll your hand down the side of the elephant and you know where, you know which directions your hand would be turning as you're going down that belly. Um, my question for everybody watching is what is it about the way that this is drawn that really can um, communicates that kind of contour information so clearly. What is Ray Bonto doing on the page that is making that work? Mary Larson is pointing out that the value is, is really helping here. So that we have places where we're kind of sinking into darkness. So we're, we've got lighter places. And um, Anne Chadwick is also pointing out the line direction. 
everybody take a look at the line direction on this. So on, on uh, the big elephant there, yep, right in there. See how those lines follow, um, you know, if you were to have painted a vertical line down the side of the elephant, and then the elephant turned to this three quarter position, you would see that what had been a straight line curving the way that you see it. And that, um, those contour shading lines in there really do a lot to add this dimension. Um, Susan is pointing out that you're also then using those as a basis for cross hatching, where you then have other lines that are kind of going in from different directions. And she's pointing out how that creates this, the, the, the texture of the skin, this sort of wrinkled skin. But notice how, especially on, on Mama there, um, how following the contours of that shape does so much of the heavy lifting for helping this read and communicate. Oh, this is, this is exciting. I did it all in ink, so, and then, as for Orion, um, oh, oh, nice. And I love the kind of how you're looking in, kind of zooming in. Oh, this is really fun. Ah, uh, that's right. So it, that's so that's five hundred light years away. Uh, uh, that's really fun. That is really fun. Um, yeah, it is crazy to see, to, to time travel, to walk out your door and to see into the past. Mm. I wonder what the, uh, that star is like right now. It's, or to transfer it, myself right up next to it. It might be dead. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it could have been completely changed, but we're not gonna know for another 500 million years. <laughs> That's so million. cool. That is so yeah. cool. So did you first give yourself a, um, before you went out, did you give yourself a, a, a painted, a, a, a black painted screen that you could then use your gel pen on top of? Uh, no, I just painted it. Um, it was just from my window. We were just lying about messing around and I decided to look out of the window. I thought I saw Jupiter and then it's and then a horde of stars came and it was Orion. Ah oh that's neat. To paint this to depaint this this black background. I painted it, yeah. Ah so you, you first painted the black background and then you went on top of that with a white gel pen? Yes, it was a lot of patience. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes what you, you might do is in anticipation of that, you can pre-paint before you go out to do some astronomy stuff. You can pre-paint some darks on your pages and then use those as the ones that you will um, uh, do your white gel pen lines on, on top of. Could you hold that um, study up again? I want people to notice how having the dynamic edges of it, look towards the bottom, look towards the top, the edges. So if this were just a square of black, it would not be as visually exciting and interesting. But because there is um, the, the sort of really kind of energetic and dynamic marks on the page, right? That has like lots of motion and energy. And then that is contrasted with the very precise mapping of the stars and the notes about it. You get this really interesting visual contrast between the two, and that's really cool. Um, what pen were you using to, uh, to, to, to do that? Gel. So a, a gel pen? Yeah. Right, so there are these great little white gel pens that allow us to make white lines on that dark surface. So I'm gonna so so for folks that are thinking about doing that this tonight, I would suggest you give yourself an initial dark page that 
also has some energy and dynamism to it. Also, that's interesting. Just notice, just in terms of, um, look at that sort of that spot of orange on the bottom corner there. And just how um, that also kind of plays into this, the kind of the graphic energy of this. You really kind of want to be there watching the process. You know that there's 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 thinking and, and energy going on. Um, that's really exciting to see. This is so much fun. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, let's uh, bring in Alexander um, uh, Brennan. And hey there. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right. Well, this is my uh, page from today. And um, I wasn't sure if you were wanting to then run the water brush over the owl sketch to um, make it more, uh, but that was, um, I, I wasn't sure about that. But what I was really wanting to show here is that before I started taking these classes, I had never done any watercolor at all. So Jack, thank you so much. This is all you on this page, everything that um, I have learned in these classes. And then while we're just flipping through here, we were down at the bay taking a walk and we saw 54 species of birds, which I then oh. sketched um, uh, oh, from uh, eBird e photos mostly. Well, that's so much fun, but just uh, go, go back one, one, one page there. Um, Am I lining up here, right? Yeah. Here? So the pintail on the right, look at just, um, so I want folks just to notice the impact of that orange wash behind the whole picture that allows those whites to really stand out. And you really, it kind of, it adds so much atmosphere um, to that, that picture. There actually are a lot of, um, there are a lot of artists who will go out, this kind of ties into what we're seeing with Ray Bonto's picture. Um, and they will, before they go out, they will do um, on, on some pages in their, 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 their sketchbook or, or on, on canvases that they have, they will paint, they will pre-paint a wash in the background. And, um, and sometimes what they'll do is they will have more warm on one side and cool on the other. Um, and then they will decide like which way they're going to turn that, what is going to be up and what is going to be down when they're, they're out in the, the, the field. But this is, that is that, that wash in the background, imagine it without that, and then put that wash back in. It just, it, it gives this so much more of, you know, you can kind of feel the morning light or the evening light. Um, that's really, really effective. Let's see some more. We'd love to see um, more of so, this experience. Um, one of the cool things was w water, you know, trying to paint water is yeah. really, is really hard. So, well, I think you see on this page, I was practicing, but um, this stilt right here, just a couple lines, you know, I got that. Well, once I started looking at watercolor, you find all these artists who do uh, cool things. And then another thing I should point out is that because in your book, um, How to Nature Journal, you talk about how you get interested in something and you make it all out of scale. So notice the head on this uh, <laughs> where I just kept working it and doing stuff and trying to make it happen. And it's it's a, probably twice the size it should be. But and but and isn't yeah isn't that fascinating, you know how when we when yeah exactly when we're really interested in something you can tell where our our brains respond to that by making that element larger on the page. Yep, I I do that too. It's just and 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 I still do that right. Um, I'll be out there drawing something. I'm like, wow, I was really into the gorilla's 
you know, uh, hands and they've got these huge hands. Yeah. I don't know if you want to see any more. We'd there love 50, to. We'd love to. There were 54. <laughs> and eventually oh. I started just trying to mess around doing different things. Um, yeah. But I, I, I love the way you're also really kind of getting that full range of, of values. Those crows, uh, you know, look at, everybody check out these crows. So there's just a few little light highlights that is, and the rest were just sort of dropping into that blackness. Um, but those very intentionally left little subtle highlights are enough just to make those things glossy and to give them give them form. So, and it's it's so hard to get yourself to leave those tiny little sparkles of light in there. That's really effectively done. You know, I did that after. Um... I think, I think he's a friend of yours too. Maybe Obi Kaufman. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So I I copied this from one of his uh, from one of his uh, books. Yep. Uh, Obi Kaufman um, does, is also doing some wonderful stuff in just helping educate us about you know this you know what are the conditions of of, of forests? What are the conditions of water in this state? What are the conditions? Of, of, uh, of fire. We actually had him on, uh, he came to our first Wild Wonder as a keynote. When you look at it, yeah. Oh, and that little uh, um, house finch, mm -hmm. a little house finch there. Um, everybody notice just as we saw those lines wrapping around the elephant here, notice um, those lines on the chest and how they curve around the sides. That's what, get, if those went straight to the sides, this would feel flat. But it's, it is because they are curving, like the contours on the elephant, that you get this sense of roundness in the chest of that bird. Very effectively done. I'm not sure if you want to see any more. Love to. Let's see. What... On this one, a friend of mine you know, does everything with the black pen and then colors it in. So on the uh, the oyster catchers, um, I tried doing that, and it, it it's pretty cool. I mean, there's just a lot of fun ways to try stuff. That that is fun. Yeah, just trying out all sorts of different techniques. <clears throat> Really, really fun. These have such a feeling of life to them. Like I feel like you're starling. You're like it's it's really you can sort of feel the weight of the bird. It feels very kind of active and looking around. Your oyster catchers, um, you know, just so lively. The one's picked up its foot, the other three quarter view from the back, then turning its head around the other way. Um, you're not afraid of those angles. You're not afraid of those shapes and. Um, those, those just sort of feel like iconic oyster catchers. It reminds me of the old, um, I used to love the old oyster catcher logo for the Point Reyes Bird Observatory. Um, the, uh, and uh, this takes me back there. So, uh, oh, this is really exciting to see. And it, it just also just shows the impact of, you've been putting in tons of brush miles here. Tons and tons of brush miles. Yeah, I was trying to do, uh, at least one a day. Um, yeah, and, and it makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. Oh, the little bit of gloss on the check uh, on the chest of the Phoebe. Oh, that is really fun. Oh, oh, hey, thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you so much for sharing that. Well, thank you for teaching me how to do watercolors. Well, you know, the critical thing, um, the critical thing is that you then put in the miles, right? Yeah. And you, know, you can watch all the videos that you want. You can read all the books. You can fill shelves with how to do books. But if you're not willing to kind of get in there and do the first one, and then the one after that, and then the one after that, and the one after that, um, you don't give your brain an opportunity to develop. But here you have just, you put in so many pencil miles and the, the results 
um, speak for themselves. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Oh, that was really fun. That was really fun to see. Look at that book, just so, so many um, pictures in there. Just, it, it shows that, you know, you're not stuck with the brain that you're born with. You change your brain, you build the brain you want to have through the work that you do. So all of these things are skills. They're skills that we can all develop if we decide to do it. And um, there's, in our culture, there's lots of forces that are telling us that like, you know, like, oh, you know, you're not, you're not a musical person, right? Or you're not a math person. Um, you're not a, you know, fill in the blank person. And so when we believe that, if we believe that, there's no reason to try. Because of course, if I'm not a musical person, then I can't, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to do it. But um, all the research shows that these are just, these are skills that we can all develop if we start doing it. So I'm now, I'm, because my, my daughters are doing, I'm starting to learn to play the ukulele. <laughs> and, and, and my daughters are both so much better. See, they were taking ukulele classes and I wanted to see, have them watch me on the sort of the struggling part of a growth curve. And because um, I would tell them like with the drawings, like, you know, it's, it's, it's practice. And they'd been, they'd taken the ukulele for several years. And so I started taking lessons. And so they're both, they're both way up here. And I'm like, I'm, I'm working at it. And, and, I, and I try to, like, I try to practice when they're home so they can see me just sort of sitting in the corner of the room, kind of going point, 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 point. And then they'll sometimes come up and sit next to me and kind of go like, right? and, and, and show me things. And I'm getting better. I'm starting to kind of get some, a little bit of, I'm, I'm getting step-by-step step more Yuki. And we can do this with anything we choose to do. And it's, the idea of a growth mindset is incredibly empowering. Again, your brain can grow the structures to learn all these different skills if you if you just do it if you do it if you put in that time and it makes a huge difference um and of course in this lifetime there's not enough time to do everything wouldn't that be fun um you get to pick what it is that brings you alive um the poet uh, david white says Anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. So those things that really bring you alive, don't be afraid of, of like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not there yet. But if, if it is something that gets you excited, just do it and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again. And after that, do it again. And you can develop all of these skills. And um, it's really, really fun. So um, I recommend to everybody to always be at some point on the, 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 like the, the, the challenging part of, of, of a growth curve on something that you're doing. And you can even do this on things that you're already proficient at. What you're trying to do is then like, like you're gonna try to stretch your brain here. So where you're in a position where you, know, you feel that struggle. If you're not doing things where you feel a little bit of the struggle, your brain isn't growing. Your brain isn't growing. So you want to be in that place of, of struggle. And not, not so much that you feel overwhelmed and like, ah, I'm sinking, right? But, but you want to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. And like, like you say, like, I can't do, I can't do uh, watercolor yet, right? And so then you start doing one a day and then the next one, and then the next one, the next one, and then you're doing birds, right? And then you're doing little experiments, like what happens if I, and then you're gonna take your, um, you know, and you, you and, and when at some point that becomes like really just second nature to you, then on some other part of either, 
you know, a, a different part of developing watercolor stuff. Maybe then it's botanicals and flowers and you move into a different subject area. Or maybe it's a different medium. You start working with pen and ink and sort of trying to kind of feel the elephant, right? And you, you keep yourself on some challenging part of that growth curve the whole time. And there's all sorts of um, development that then happens in our brain. And that's really, really fun. So if you are just tuning in right now, um, um, we actually started our workshop um, two hours ago. <laughs> Um, because of, um, we, we had, we discussed some time ago that, uh, we would be moving, uh, we might be moving our times. We, I sent out some polls to the nature journal club of what times during the day would be the most, uh, the best for most people. And, um, the, it, it looked like for most people around the globe, um, starting at 10 o'clock Pacific time rather than noon Pacific time would be much better. So then our friends in Europe were, uh, I know, I've, I don't know how many times I've seen you Valters with your headlamp on <laughs> the, uh, um, or uh, Ray Bonto in your pajamas. Um, the, uh, so to make it easier for you folks, uh, we've, we've kind of moved that, uh, our start time a little bit earlier. Um, and I know that that is going to cause some complications in, in, in some people's schedules, but I think that that is going to be, uh, make your circadian rhythms much, much, much better. So our regular start time is now going to be two, two hours earlier. Um, but we just had a workshop on, on drawing rocks and we'll get that up um, online soon for you. I also want to send a shout out and thank you to Ivea, who's been doing a lot of the heavy lifting on getting the, um, the videos processed and and put up for everybody to see so i know that that's it, it's it's time consuming and you're like you're being really intentional about where you start them and stop them and it is um it's really 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 helpful and so uh everybody mad props to Ivea, the mad botanist for um the uh let's see i'm gonna add you in on spotlight there there you are Hello. um so i i really really appreciate you you do that that really kind of helps the helps us be able to, to, to communicate. My pleasure, thank you. I'm happy to do it. Um, so before we, um, uh, before we close out here, um, just to gonna check in with uh, folks a little bit more. I see Walters, you've got a comment, a thought, a question, and hey, it's good to see you. So Hi. would, would uh, two hours earlier start be helpful? Perfect. It's uh, it usually so it's ten o'clock right now uh here, but then it would start two hours earlier. Then it would start at eight, so that would be just perfect. Yeah, and if, uh, if we much, like much we've been now two hours into it, that, again that's midnight in Latvia when you'd be yeah. ending, and that's just not good for your next day. So no, definitely we're, we're gonna, not. We're gonna, but but I just want to let you know that. Um, you know, you, in spite of that time difference, you've been a regular with us and um, that, uh, so uh, I, 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 I so appreciate and respect you giving us um, that time um, and making that sacrifice of, you know, oh, so, oh, hey, how did the windsurfing competition go? Uh, uh, yeah, I was in Denmark uh, for the windsurfing competition and it didn't look very promising uh, on the first days because I think I told that I strained my finger and it wasn't looking very good, but we had more windy days and I got third. So right now third in the U17s and in the world championships, so. <laughs> that is really, really, really cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Super happy about it. Super. It was very, very close to second, but I'm still very happy because it was just fun windsurfing and the second place, uh, the guy who took second place is a local there and he's a very good windsurfer. Knows all the local so. wind patterns. Yeah. So yeah. 
so he knows the waves, the currents, and the way and the wind. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to him. That that's that that's fair. So yeah, two two thoughts on that. Um, one is that should you ever find yourself in the Bay Area, first of all, we're going uh, journaling together. Um, but also the San Francisco Bay Area is a fantastic place for windsurfing. There's a lot of places along the Bay that uh, people uh, launch from. And um, I can uh, get you on, onto some places where you can rent a board and uh, have a blast out there. Um, and the second fun. is that you're lucky that you got third place. And here's why. There's this interesting research. It, and, and if you look at, go, go on, like look, look at Olympic events right, uh, sort of the winners of Olympic events. And what you'll see is the person with the gold medal standing up there going, and you'll see the person with the silver medal standing there like this. And you'll see the person with the bronze medal going. Yeah, right? yeah, it's, it, we this, we this, uh, discussed this with my uh, mom, he, she said like third place, third and first place is like the best places because yeah. If you're second, you're like, oh, it's so close to first place. But if you're fourth, then again, you are so close to the podium. So third yeah. is just perfect. Yeah. yeah. So third, third place, you're, you're there, you're in the podium. You're like, Dude, that was awesome. Right. The, the, the second place person is, and it, you know, this is, they, they've, they've done sort of interviews with, with, with people who are kind of competing and you can just sort of see it in the facial expressions. Just, just go check out some Olympic things and look at the, the silver, the silver medalists and the silver medalists are like, I could have been gold. I, I didn't get gold. Right, and you you interview them later on, and the 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 what the the silver medalists take home is that they didn't get gold, mm -hmm. and what the gold and the bronze people take home is like I was in the Olympics, I look like I won something, I got this is so cool, right? So hey, congratulations, congratulations for getting third, and um, yeah, I'm, thank you. I'm uh, I'm I'm really glad. Uh, has there been any kind of cool uh, observations that you've made nature-wise? Any kind of uh, journaling moments that you wanted to share? There are. Uh, I was in uh, I was in uh, Estonia on a little uh, surf trip uh, to Estonia to an island called Hiuma. The last five days, uh, I was there and I journal. I did get to journal a bit. Uh, on one day because the rest of the days were windy and we were on the water but uh, I had one day and I did journal uh, uh, like this great big rock that I found in the middle of the forest but there's a problem that I forgot my journal in my mom's work so <sighs> unfortunately cannot share we'll, this time but uh, we'll see it uh, another time yeah got some uh Got some flowers in there, a couple of birds, and but I wanted to share one thing. Just about like three hours ago in mail, I received this. <laughs> it's looking very, very good. Oh, very there's good. gonna be some fun in there. And I'm I i love the reference material. That's sometimes uh I love I like to like take notes in these classes in my journal also uh, then I can just go a couple of pages back and you know see the techniques but here you have already everything like like I forget or I need some inspiration I can look at these letters how to write better so and uh, it's looking very good I still cannot decide I'm going to uh, the Canary Islands for quite a long time time and I stocked up on journals I also do you have this one? It's a uh, the Stratmar tone yeah. pen. I had Those the gray good. one. Yeah, but uh, so uh, also this one, and I still cannot decide which one I'm gonna use first because uh, there in the Canary Islands, it's kind of a desert. There's not much greenness there, so I thought maybe the tone paper would be a really good one. But I think I'm gonna try this one first. I'm just so excited about this one, so. And then with, with that one, there's, it's got the brown paper pages in the back also. So yeah. sometimes when you need tone paper, you can jump into that. And, yeah. Um, it, it was a bit hard to get. I, would, I wanted to uh, purchase it off your website, but, but because of customs and yeah, it's, it's hard with international shipping. We've been expensive. trying to figure that out. 
Yeah, um, I I did purchase it through Amazon, but I didn't make a donation, and we're doing a contribution to the nature also. This uh, next week, we are going uh, to clear out the trees. There's the ecosystem I told you about in the spring. There's dunes, uh, like these sandy dunes right next to my house. Mm -hmm. And the pines have been growing, them, uh, growing in them and just uh, kind of shading the flowers that are growing there and not giving light to the insects. So we are clearing out spaces. We're gonna have a lot of people hopefully and uh, just uh, kind of restore the environment, so. That's great. That's really cool. I, I, and thank you so much. I'm going to bring on uh, Avea, who's also um, crazy into stewardship here. Um, the, um, the, the, it is really neat that you're taking, uh, are you doing this as a family to go do the restoration work out there? Yeah, well, I had this project uh, in already in spring that I wanted to do it, but we kind of, uh, a friend of mine who is a bird watcher, he kind of pushed the project forward and they got the permission from uh, like the community center that is here and the uh, guys from the nature uh, thing to allow this. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we're going, uh, me and my family, we are going and we're bringing some friends so we can, well, cut down some trees. That's so cool. Uh, actually, I'm also going to bring in Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science. So you've now got like this is this is like the 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 kind of part of the restoration posse of the uh, Nature Journal Club. So we all want to send you mad props out there doing it. And I love that you're turning this into that it's turning into a community event. You're doing this with with your family. You're doing restoration also with um, all of uh, you're you're bringing in some 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 friends along. Um, you know, that is, this, this is what gives me hope for our species. Same, yes. Right? Are you taking any notes on their work? Like, are you journaling at all about your restoration work? Well, it's happening next week. I haven't done any research for it now. Uh, we are still, uh, I'm gonna go in the next couple of days probably with the, guy who kind of inspects uh, the place to kind of uh, see what we have to do exactly and hopefully going to journal then and probably in the restoration uh, time uh, also going to take down some night no notes and uh, drawings but mostly I'm going to be there with an axe and uh, cutting down trees so that's, that's great <clears throat> that's really awesome oh now Anne's got something to, to share here on this thought yeah, I'm so glad you're doing that, Walter. That is fantastic. And um, I was telling Ivea that I went with Point Blue scientists just Tuesday out to a beach area on Tamales Bay, actually. And we were harvesting seeds and cuttings and things that we're going to use in native plant restoration in this watershed. And an intern had done this wonderful job of showing the plants and the seeds and the different phases that you might find. And I was thinking I would nature journal this. She did it photographically, but it's super helpful in looking at like, like here are some plants that you might be looking for and here's what they look like and the size of them and the phases that they go through and how you might harvest. And it gives more detail down here. So that might be some ideas about things to, to journal. I know you'll be cutting trees, which is also super important, but just exciting to think about. Um, and Avea did a, a great show on um, nature journaling your restoration project. So is, is, is the recording that. for that up? Yes, I will put it into yeah. the chat. Yeah, let, let's put the, the link for it. So you might, yeah, Voltage, you might want to check out Avea's mm -hmm presentation on doing nature journaling, restoration connected journaling. Um, Definitely. That would, that yeah. would be really cool. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're not going to have any flowers now at, because there's very strict kind of rules when you can uh, uh, 
uh, go there and do actually some work. Um, you cannot do anything the whole summer. And uh, so kind of now is uh, like a time when it's nothing blooming and there are uh, no insects almost. Uh, so, uh, so we're not gonna hurt any wildlife. So just to clear it out and then in the springtime, it's gonna be good cleared out spaces for the insects, sun for the flowers, and uh, hopefully we can uh, restore the environment. Fantastic. Again, this is really gives me hope for this is this is exactly the kind of thinking um, that and and attitude that we need to 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 move us along on this planet. Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. Um, so uh, in yes. Yeah. Well. One thing I uh, will kind of uh, suggestion that I wanted to do about uh, like a workshop maybe, uh, or uh, it, it isn't a drawing workshop, but it would be really cool to have like a, uh, an hour like we did with uh, exploring with the master naturalist David, uh, mm -hmm. like to explore with you, you could show your uh journal pages and stuff talk about what you've been up to because uh it's a really big inspiration i uh was uh on instagram recently and uh, i was just looking through like kind of your journal pages layout because that's just a great source, uh, source of uh, inspiration to look at and just get some ideas what to put down in my journal um so kind of a journal flip and kind of take people through journal flip yeah maybe some tips and tricks on like fast tips and tricks and uh just a flip through yeah that, that sounds like it'd be fun to do i'd love to do that we'll definitely for me excellent i will look forward to seeing you there yeah all right so um again vultures thank you so much for for being with us here today um, if you are just joining us, and congratulations again, Falters, on on, on the uh, windsurf championship. Um, the uh, if you're just joining us today, uh, this is actually the end of our class um, because we started at nine o'clock uh, Pacific time. We did a uh, sent out a survey. Sorry, ten o'clock. That's what happens when dyslexics try to give you time directions. Time. Like, yes, ten o'clock. Thank you, Anne. Um, the uh, at at. Uh, so 10 o'clock Pacific is the new start time for these workshops. Um, if you're just turning in now to see the workshop on how to draw rocks, um, we will have the recording of that up soon. Um, and um, the, uh, but our regular start time is going to be 10 o'clock Pacific time, which will make things a lot easier for people um, uh, all across the United States and um, throughout Europe um, to be able to catch these workshops without staying up into the wee hours of the night. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, it was just a delight to see you. I'm going to turn off the recording now, and um, I want to thank you again um, for being here with us.